All right, we'd like to start with the next uh, panel. Uh, we have this panel is political legitimacy and the birth spread of empires. For me. Our first speaker is Gendun Demba of the Darje Museum in Darje Museum in Chengdu. Uh, and his talk will be uh, translated by Paul Dengel, who is a graduate student, doctoral student at uh, Columbia University. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, the topic of my talk today is uh, the history of Songkha Kingdom and Buddhist art. <laughs> So the general layout of my talk is um, four points. And first, um, uh, to discuss why we need to talk about um, Buddhist art in relation to the kingdom of uh, in relation to the Tsongkha Kingdom. Second, um, a brief history of Tsongkha Kingdom. Third, um, the relationship between the Tsongkha Kingdom and the Kingdom of Ngari. And the fourth one uh, is, uh, um, is the reception of, of uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhist teachers from both uh, uh, Central Tibet and from India uh, to, to the Tsongkha Kingdom. The <laughs> Uh, so in the recent there's been uh, scholarship and research on the on, on Buddhist art in relation to the, uh, to the Shisha kingdom, the Tangut kingdom, or, or the kingdom of Kuke, or the, or the discussion of Buddhist, uh, Buddhist art in relation to the Song dynasty, but uh, there has been a silence or, or negligence of this discussion on uh, Buddhist art in relation to, um, uh, to the kingdom of Tsongkha. Oh, yeah. Because there is no um, discussion, no research on the, on the history or on the history of art of um, Buddhist art in relation to, uh, to the kingdom of Tsongkha. I'm going to talk about um, the existence of Buddhist art in, in, in the Tsongkha Kingdom. Uh, 
I think the, the Buddhist art that was produced in the Tsongkha kingdom influenced to a great deal of the Buddhist art that was produced in, in the Shisha kingdom as well as later in the uh, Mongol, king, Mongol court. Zambo <laughs> Cola Simulasqua, Tugija Bugalasqua, Tugisimulasqua, Cola, Zamu, Jasila, Zamu, Tomozi. So the, the kingdom of Tsongkha was founded by a, a descendant of the Tibetan imperial family um, from Ngari. And uh, the name of the first emperor is uh, Emperor Tide, who, um, who at, at a certain time became a very powerful. Uh, a powerful king in the region and who actually also received brides from uh, from the Shisha kingdom as well uh, as well as other other uh, small kingdoms um, in the in the region and the tonki yo kapkaniel so zire bo sha kamre so she amare she amare dinan beta di sanyor der kuta so wo ik na na ono jirjali sha kono to mozre this, this uh, map shows a, a rough sort of estimate of the regions that were under the Shisha king, under the, under the Song Kingdom. Um, the names of the places are written in Tibetan. Uh, it, it shows uh, uh, Chilankar, which is the modern day uh, Xining, and um, as well as um, Tentik, uh, Tentik uh, uh, and uh, Tsongkha Dinkham, there were two different regions, the big, big um, Tsongkha and, and the small Tsongkha. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> the capital city of um, Tsongkha Kingdom is the, the modern day Xining, which was called Jilankar at the time. And this is a, a, a reconstruction of the, of the capital city. Um, at the time, it's, uh, according to the Tibetan archival sources, it says uh, there were more than 120 uh, international traders from, uh, from different regions at, in, in the city, and it was a kind of a cosmopolitan city. Uh, so there are two different narratives about the um, the origin or, or the story about where where did the the first king of um, Tonka Kingdom came from, the Tide um, Emperor Tide, and according to the Chinese uh, archival sources, it says that um, he was brought to to the to the region uh, from from. Uh, um, from Xinjiang, uh, from a place called Gautang, uh, uh, to the uh, to the northeast, uh, to the um, uh, to to uh, to Xining. Uh, but according to the Tibetan archival sources, it says he was born in um, in Gautang in Ngari. The Mm Chadigi Yab Ordi Sevaton Tani 
ordi perang di jabu. Ngap tu ordi sekarang tiga pagi mana di sardi sekitar. Tni kapan? Penjari. Uh, so the f uh, the father of um, Emperor Chide is the King Emperor uh, Wude, and who is also uh, a bro brother to uh, the King Wude of Burang, uh, Burang Kingdom. Right. <laughs> So, uh, the, the according to uh, to the Tibetan archival sources, um, the how how Chide got from from uh, from Ngari to 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 Amdo is that um, uh, there was a war in between the Karloks of the um, Karloks are a, a, a Turkic uh, tribe in the, in Central Asia uh, and they had a war with with the Purang Kingdom and uh, the king of uh, King Ude of Purang fought um, uh, along with along with the, uh, the uh, other t uh, tribal communities like in, in Khotan and um, and and Gilgit, um, um, they fought against the against the Karlok invasion. And um, after the defeat, um, they had to uh, they had to run to uh, some flat to back to back to Puran or to Kuge, and some flat towards uh, eastward to um, to Amdo. The Chardiga. Kapti Sunka Jab Kapton, you know, the Sinjong La Mojokuti or Digion, Kapti Sinjong La Mojoku or Diga. The new or Diga Patti Sardion, Mojavite Sinjong, Mokan Wakaru, Kaitan, Tonton. So the uh, two different Tibetan uh, tribal communities were, were fighting against the Karloks at, at two different uh, areas, one from the uh, south, uh, so modern day, um, like um, Ladakh area, and, um, and the other group uh, was led by Chide on the eastern front. Um, they were both pushing against the, the, in, the in, in, in invasion of, of the Karloks. And in, in the south, you had uh, the king uh, of, of, uh, of Burang Kingdom. <laughs> So it was a series of, uh, of uh, wars that took place between the Karloks and the Tibetan, um, uh, two different Tibetan uh, uh, kingdoms, the, the, the Tsongkha kingdom led by Chide on the eastern front and the and the Purang kingdom that, uh, from the south uh, that fought against the invasion of Karloks and that, um, that defended the invasion of, um, of Tibet by the, by the Karloks. So the tradition is <laughs> that the Karloks are the same as the Karloks are the same as the Karloks are the same as the Karloks. So it was um, after the defeat that the, the uh, King Chide decided to uh, go to e eastward and then found the kingdom in, uh, in, in the modern day Xinjiang in, in Tsongkha. In here, I have uh, seen inscriptions, inscriptions of Tibetans who fought against the uh, Karloks at the time, and this uh, 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 strong inscription is in, uh, in Kargil, in, in, in the... Jammu and Kashmir state of India. Uh, 
And it, it, it shows about the, the, um, the war that took place in, in uh, uh, Dukilo, which, which falls uh, in, in the 12th, uh, um, and 1288. What <laughs> Mm-hmm. So uh, from here we could see that um, that it's not that um, King Emperor Chide got uh, got to uh, to Tsongkha alone, like uh, what is being said in the in the Chinese sources. Um, that he was uh, was taken from a Xinjiang area t- by a trader, and and then he is responsible for founding the the Tsongkha Kingdom. But according to uh, according to the to Tibetan sources, it, uh, and, and also this um, evidences that we have about the war that took place, it shows that um, um, Tsongkha Kingdom was found not just by Tide, but Tide also fled along with a group of army um, after the defeat to the east. Mm-hmm. So during uh, during King Chede's uh, reign in in Tsongkha, um, he w- is he was also responsible for producing a, a lot of Buddhist uh, artwork and uh, uh, things like uh, uh, murals that we uh, we could still see. In, uh, for example, in this cave temple in, in Tentik. Tante da kundu, yah tante gumba ke manchen a tropics ke na nu debris gire. Di so, di chortan de ke thona manu ke use gundo mazu yoke. The <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, so this is an a stone in, in, inscription, uh, a mural in the in a cave that is also um, south to that is located in the south um, of Tentik. And here you could see um, uh, this is an example of 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 uh, artwork. Um, that was produced under under uh, Emperor uh, Emperor today. Mm-hmm. So according to the uh, Tibetan historical sex uh, uh, historical source, Deva uh, Chimjong, the religious history of uh, Deva, uh, it says the Lachin Gompa Rapsil is. Uh, uh, produced a lot of um, uh, Buddhist art a, a, in the region at the time. Mm-hmm. When you look at the uh, yeah, at the time uh, when the Chide was uh, around and also Lachin Kumpa Rapsil, you could see there was a, a, an overlap uh, in between over the, in the life. Mm-hmm. 
Scholars who have studied these inscriptions are, um, have maintained that these uh, are from the, seven, six, uh, from the fifth or the sixth centuries, but I think by studying the orthographic sort of features of these uh, um, inscriptions, I think we could, um, I, I, I'm proposing that this actually belongs to the, um, to the 11th century. For example, if you look at the, uh, uh, the, the symbol of Ma in, in, the, in, 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 uh, in the word uh, Om, or the small I, 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 that has a, a different sort of a, um, feature to it, and this, uh, both the, when you compare this to, to uh, text, it's, it's very similar, and it's, uh, it's pretty obvious that it's, this belongs to the 11th century. This is also another inscription from the same um, from the same cave uh, temple uh, temple and um, uh, like the the money inscription that we we just saw um, this one also I think belongs unlike what uh, others have studied as uh, belonging to the sixth and fifth and the sixth century. I think this is also a, a product of the 11th century. Jimson, Jimson, that David the So we could conclude that by st looking at the the color the 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 way the colors are used and also um the fact that they are um in the same um in the same cave they are yeah, this is also another example of that I think is from the from the 11th century, uh, unlike what uh, other scholars have studied as belonging to the fifth, by by studying the uh, the colors and. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a very distinctive. Um, um, Distinctive picture of of um, of the people depicted in here because of the the very unique hat that is uh, that is being painted there. Mm -hmm. Some scholars have uh, argued that this uh, is a, a unique uh, characteristic of the artwork uh, in an Asia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the first scholars that was um, invited um, and received from the Central Tibet to Tsongkha Kingdom, and, the, and he's Jijang uh, Lozawa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Kendi normal oza agit injolalna daya dara agit kita muka tangkai cek kerja muka. Tapi nada cedih dia dina gaya dara yopi cek. Tapi normal oza yang asyik juga dana kerja. Tapi itu mana dia tisu kat mana itu untuk tisu halam tu hitu kerja untuk dia cerjang oza. Tisu kata tangkai je uti tangkai je cedih kerja. Tapi tisu kat mana dia nana. Tapi ina kerja sih kerja. Tertentu ni kan, ni lala tu tertentu kabri tu kokra. Yang jo itu nada tu dih kabri, contohnya jo terdih. So the we don't know the about the birth dates of 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 Chilang Chilang Lozawa, but we have we know from from other historical documents that Chilang Lozawa he sent he was given a hundred. Um, 100 kilos or kilos of uh, of uh, of gold by the Tsongkha, Tsongkha emperor, and he sent that to his uh, to his teacher Drogmi Drogmi Lozawa to central Tibet, and he in 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 as a receipt he he asked for something uh, from from Drogmi Lozawa, and he was giving a in return he was giving as a as a as a, as a receipt he was giving a tanga of uh, of uh, of hewajra. Um, and uh, although we don't know uh, which emperor exactly uh, was um, responsible for inviting uh, Chilang Lozawa to, to the Tsongkha Kingdom, uh, I think we could, uh, uh, because we know that the, during that time, Drogmin Lozawa was, was also, also alive, we could say um, that it was during the first emperor, Emperor Tede. <laughs> The both Dogmen Lozawa and and Chijang Lozawa are of the Sarcha lineage. And this this shows the 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 relationship between the Sarcha and the Dogmen Lozawa. And this this shows the 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 relationship of the Sarcha the Sarcha sect and to the Tsongkha Kingdom. Panchen Bentok Samba. The Panchen Bentok Samba. The Marchik Shami. The name that the young Tsongkha Jew Dan Jiang Lozawa Bandita. Bentuk sembang di kaki kaki mana yang mari? Ini loza sama sanjil kuni yang zonka jauh ke dan jangi zonki itu penuh. Zonki itu penuh tercium. Bencin bentuk sembang cundi ke loza itu cai mana itu? Ina yang loza sama sanjil ke cundu itu lala ke mana cilu tan di di lala ke mana di? Tapi so rasam kita pun ina sama sanjil ke semua ni yang macam sama tu kan? Macam sama ke cundi ke loza itu tan dari. So we again we don't know exactly. Uh, um, we know that Pinchin um, Pentraksamba was again another sc uh, major scholar who was invited uh, to the Tsongkha Kingdom, but we don't know his uh, birth dates, um, and so we um, don't know exactly who who which emperor invited uh, him to the to the to the Tsongkha Kingdom. Ada di mana ciri sana? Kini sangka jauh buku dari sisi mana? Tiskap te, tiskap te, dan demo juga kawat kita untuk kita pelajari lah. So there are different conflicting dates about his birth, and but still we could roughly say that it overlaps with the the reign of today. Today tu jelah ke mana? Hal tertunjuk kawat kita untuk sana. So so yeah. So this probably was during the second emperor Tunchen of the Songkha Kingdom. That which shows that the continuity of this tradition of inviting um, uh, Buddhist scholars from India and from Central Tibet to to Songkha Kingdom. So Tsongkha, Penchim Pontrak Samba was first invited by the Ngari Kingdom from uh, from India, and then later on, after staying there for a few years, he was invited by the Tsongkha Kingdom to to Tsongkha. Penchim Pontrak Samba was first invited by the Penchim Pontrak Samba was first invited by the Tsongkha Kingdom to Tsongkha. Penchim Pontrak Samba was first invited by the Tsongkha Kingdom to Tsongkha. Nyan lo zawa ke loma mal lo zawa. Mal lo zawa ke loma di sachin kengga nyan bori. Di yang cik sarjaya ni cikgu cerjik ke tonisha na sarjaya ni. So this is also 
the scholar, the Benjamin um, Pantak Sambai is also related to the to the Sashya, uh, Sashya lineage, and whose student is the Nyen Lozawa, whose uh, student is Mal Lozawa, so it's all um, Sashya, related to Sashya, uh, to, to Sashya Kunganyangbo and uh, other Sashya, uh, Sashya lineage, basically. Then Sarcia that the Lojatons on the Gansu was uh, another uh, major scholar from uh, from Nepal who was again first invited by uh, by the emperor, uh, by the king of Ngari, and then later on he was uh, again from Ngari invited to Tsongkha Kingdom, and then from Tsongkha to Shisha Kingdom, and later he he died in in. Uh, so in, in later in his life he, he, he died in, in a uh, region called um, Lojaton in, in the Kansu. So although again we don't know about the birth dates of um, of of this uh, scholar, we know that he was invited by uh, Ngo Lozawa, uh, who was around uh, uh, from the 1059 to the 1109. Mm. So again, this shows that he. Yeah, so in, in temporarily we can see that he, he was uh, active in, in Tsongkha around this time. This is again another um, scholar who, is, who has a, a rich sort of connections uh, student teacher student relationship connections with with the such a lineage such a, uh, including such a gunganyambo so this is a very uh, important and, and valuable uh, tanka that we have in the Podala. Um, and all those scholars have, uh, have maintained that this um, belongs to the Yuan, Yuan period. Um, I think this, is, this precedes the time that they have a, uh, the the mm. I think this yeah belongs to the twelfth century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The reason that I why I think this um, this tanka belongs this tanka of Ashila belongs to the to the 12th century is the 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 the, the portraits of numbers uh, seven and seven eight and eight nine and ten all belong to the to to the uh, such a such a lineage of. Uh, of 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 uh, of is is the teacher of Sachin Kanganyambo. Mm. 
Marinade, Yonche Givishin Chimbo, Jetun Kuntrapa Jamson Lab, Kamba Homa Chanson Ditachi Pavalazi, Pelzin and Discussandoa. The Kamba Homa Chanson Ditaz Kununda, Sonkil Tavachiri. So here the inscription says that this, um, this tanka of, me, uh, of uh, Achala was offered by, a, by the student Kamba Homa Chanson uh, was offered by. Um, the, uh, the student Jiangsun uh, of of Tonka. The Jimson, the you know Jimson is the reason. The Kun Jimson Tokwa Jamson, Sundum Munona, Chief Jurench and Tomashi Shavashi, so T. Jarson is the reason. Sashi Ganyan Tokwa Jamson, Sonki, Jamson, Geno, Sundi Tazi, the Jarson Sawyo cousin. It's also in, in there is also the textual evidence to this uh, in the uh, in in the yeah in the in one of the songbums of Jason Trapa Jamson it says that um, that uh, uh, in, uh, that, that Trapa Jamson received this uh, this uh, this tanka from the student from uh, um, from Tsongkha. So one reason why I'm uh, suggesting that this belongs to uh, an earlier time than, than it's uh, people have understood is that uh, in this tanka, you see that unlike the most um, usual portrayal of Jason Trapa Jamsen as, as having gray hair in most of the uh, tankas, in here you have his hair black and it shows that um, when this tanka, this particular tanka was, uh, was commissioned or painted, Jason Trapa Jamsen was still um, relatively young. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So it's not not accident that the the UN emperors invited uh, invited uh, such a painter to 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 the UN court. It has a, a has this kind of precedence to it, uh, which is why the the connection with the Sasha lineage in particular. So in the end, I want to highlight the fact that it was uh, due to it was due to the the exploit of um, of Emperor Chide and also Emperor Ude of of, of Puran Kingdom that who were able to defend Tibet against the uh, against the invasion of Karloks and. Uh, that probably stopped um, us from being converted to Islam. Thank you. We're going to be having questions afterwards, so I'm sure you have a lot of questions about that unbelievably um, interesting and rich presentation. Uh, next speaker is Curtis Schaefer from the University of Virginia talking on scripture, politics, and war in the age of the fifth Dalai Lama. Good morning. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me here. It is generally accepted that the era of the fifth Dalai Lama, roughly the period from his enthronement as leader of Tibet in 1642 to the dawn of the 18th century, when his government began to lose control, was a formative moment in the creation of a central Tibetan national identity. An identity centered in large part upon the Dalai Lama, the Potala Palace of the Dalai Lamas, and the Holy Temples of Lhasa. During this era, the Dalai Lama was transformed from an ordinary incarnation among the many associated with particular Buddhist schools 
into the protector of the country. In 1646, one writer would say that due to the good works of the fifth Dalai Lama, the whole of Tibet was now sent, uh, uh, centered by a white parasol of benevolent protection. And in 1698, another writer could say that the Dalai Lama's government serves Tibet just as a bodhisattva, that saintly hero of Mahayana Buddhism, serves all of humanity. To the extent that the Dalai Lama's government was successful in achieving political and cultural leadership in Tibet, how did it proceed in successfully carrying this transformation out? Now, while not wanting at all to ignore economic and military factors contributing to the rise of the Dalai Lama from the local religious leader to national protector, I suggest that an interesting part of the answer to this question lies in the writings by the fifth Dalai Lama, by and about the fifth Dalai Lama, composed during and shortly after his reign. Through shrewd adaptation and redeployment of commonly available cultural materials, such as classical Buddhist literature, these writings largely sought to legitimize and memorialize the fifth Dalai Lama. The main technique employed in these writings to accomplish this was the reformation of classical Buddhist traditions of practice and myth in a contemporary Tibetan context. The primary effect of these and related writings was to establish the public acceptance of the sovereignty of the Dalai Lama's rule, characterized as one of absolute benevolence, over Tibet. This effect can be traced in the continued importance of the institution of the Dalai Lamas and the Potala in central Tibetan cultural life, despite the political vicissitudes of the Dalai Lamas and their regents as political leaders. Two short works exemplify this interplay between canon and contemporary innovation in the era of the fifth Dalai Lama. The first is the biography of the fifth Dalai Lama composed in 1646 by Mondrowa Jamyang Wangyal Dorje. The second work is a proclamation issued in the fall of 1697 by Sangye Gyatso. Composed 15 years after the Dalai Lama's death in 1682, this proclamation argues that the salt used to embalm the fifth Dalai Lama uh, the fifth Dalai Lama's corpse should be accepted as relics of the deceased leader and be treated as equal in every way to the bodily relics obtained from the more traditional means of disposing with the corpses of holy people, cremation. What links these two small examples, uh, Mondrowa and, and Sangye Dorje's, drawn from the massive corpus of writing composed during this period and dedicated to the fifth Dalai Lama, is that each places priority upon the citation, expl explication, and application of canonical Buddhist literature. Anywhere from a third to over a half of each work is comprised of can canonical citations. Here I'm particularly interested in the ways in which these two writers use canonical literature to comment on challenging social situations, as well as, as in where we might see the Buddhist canons used to affect specific social changes. For while many of the canonical works that they cite are well known to students of Tibetan exegetical literature, we are rarely offered a chance to see how such classics of canonical literature were used beyond the realm of scholastic exegesis. So let's turn to Mundrawa. Mundrawa completed his life story of the Dalai Lama in June of 1646. It thus covers the years 1617 to 1646, from the Dalai Lama's birth to the middle of his 28th year. Only four years earlier, the Dalai Lama had been given sovereignty over Tibet by the Mongol leader, Kushri Khan. Now, in 1646, the Potala Palace in Lhasa was only one year into construction. In Mundrawa's life, then, we hear from a time in which the power, prestige, and authority of the fifth Dalai Lama were literally in the making. Mundrawa weaves his work into, uh, uh, into his work almost 200 citations from both Buddhist canonical literature and Tibetan writers of the past, using the words of previous authorities to offer what we might loosely term a theological commentary on the social and political challenges faced by the fifth Dalai Lama. So one example out of those 200s is going to illustrate this for us this morning. In 1642, the Mongol leader Gushri Khan led a bloody but successful campaign against the army of the leader of the Tsang region. This conflict between the Dalai Lama's Mo Mongol supporters and the Tibetan leader of Tsang offers a challenge to the biographer wishing to portray the new government as a white parasol of benevolent protection. How is it that a foreign army can engage in brutal conflict for the sake of a leader identified as uh, Avalokiteshvara, Bodhisattva of Compassion? What will the fate of the soldiers be, having killed so many? What destiny will the leader of the Tsang reap with, with his history of violence against the Dalai Lama's school? Shantideva's classic work on Buddhist ethics, the Bodhisattva Charya Avatara, Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life, provides the means to interpret these events in a manner favorable to the Dalai Lama. 
As Gushri Khan waged war upon the Tsang leader, the Dalai Lama, who would ultimately benefit from Tsang's defeat, beheld his comp opponent with compassion rather than enmity. Mondrowa accentuates the sympathetic, sympathetic attitude toward his enemy with a verse from the Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. Here's verse, chapter 1, uh, verse 36. In whom the holy jewel of mind has arisen, I pay homage. To whom even causing harm produces joy, to that source of ha happiness, I pay homage. So just so, according to Mondrowa, the Dalai Lama developed uncontrollable pity toward the song leader and his people for, quote, the life and limb of the soldiers floating like driftwood in order to quickly protect their quick destruction, end quote. But this verse is not simply about the Dalai Lama's compassion. It is about his power as a leader in comparison with the Tsang ruler. For though the Tsang ruler had sought to ruin the Gelukpa tradition, through the Dalai Lama's grace, he would eventually find joy even in his misguided attempt to harm his, this emanation of Avalokiteshvara. And what of the troops? It is a given that they had killed many people, a fact that might lead anyone to question the effects of their actions upon their karmic situation. What will happen to them, and to what extent are the beneficiaries of their violent actions, the Dalai Lama, foremost among them, culpable for their actions? A citation from another classic Indian philosophical work, Chandrakirti's Majamaka Avatara, or Introduction to the Middle Way, helps to interpret, or, or perhaps more accurately, to deflect criticism away from their actions. It is true, Mondro appears to admit, uh, that, as it is said in Guna Prabha's Vinaya Treatise, the Karma Shataka, quote, the karmic actions of beings cannot be lost even in 100 eons. They gather, and when their time comes, they develop into a result. Now, one would normally think that this result, uh, that the result incurred by the troops in killing their enemies would be exclusively negative, especially in light of this verse from the Vinaya literature. Yet here, Mondrowa inserts a single line of verse from Chandrakirti's introduction to the Middle Way to diffuse the situation. And this line simply reads, in this chapter 6, verse 42, the line reads, thinking about cause and effect is discouraged. And he expands on this verse. He expands on this verse stating, quote, when the seeds of good and bad karma laying latent in each embodied being are collected in come time, it is difficult to fathom how the cause of killing will mature into a result. Suddenly, everything about the scene changes where one might condemn the soldiers to the karmic consequences of their actions, with the aid of Chandrakirti's canonical treatise, Mondrowa cautions that no one, save a Buddha perhaps, can truly comprehend what result will come from killing. A verse from a work largely dedicated to Majamaka philosophy here serves to absolve warriors of any fault in their actions, and by extension saves the Dalai Lama from having to answer for the fate of soldiers who fought for his eventual victory over Tibet. Now let me turn to another example. A public proclamation issued in the fall of 1697 by the fifth Dalai Lama's regent, Sangye Gyatso. To understand the import of this proclamation, it is useful to have some background to the circumstances of its creation. On April 14, 1695, the desiccated body of the fifth Dalai Lama was removed from the wooden casket in which it had been placed 13 years earlier on April 8, 1682, the day after his death. Wrapped in silk and cotton, packed with cinnamon, saffron, camphor, salts, and salts, his body had mummified during these years. It was now time to install the mummy in a, the 60-foot tall golden reliquary housed within the recently completed Red Palace of the Potala. Known as the single ornament of the world, the stupa was to form an essential part of both ritual and political life within the massive castle known as the Potala, the nearby Lhasa, city of Lhasa and its environs, and more widely throughout Tibet. Now, the traditional Buddhist means to preserve the remains of holy people is to cremate the corpse and collect relics from the ashes, much as the body of Shakyamuni Buddha himself had been treated. Despite this, the fifth Dalai Lama was embalmed and preserved whole at the Potala. The faithful would have to uh, accept, therefore, some material other than his bodily remains to venerate his relics. And in this case, the embalming salts used uh, to preserve him were those relics. It is Sangye Gatso's task to persuade his audience that these salt relics were legitimate despite the obvious, obvious divergence from tradition. He undertakes this largely by paraphrasing the classic source on the Buddha's death, the Mahaparinirvana Sutra. In the operatic conclusion of the sutra, the Buddha's corpse is placed upon a throne wrapped with 500 sheets of white cotton, washed in scented water, and finally set in an iron container in which it is cremated 
a process resulting in the production of bodily remains worthy of being worshipped as relics and supplicated through the efforts of writers such as those presented here to bring the pervasive and weighty authority of the Buddhist canons to bear on contemporary innovations of the new government in Lhasa. It has been argued that the book was an important component for the formation of national consciousness in Europe, for it comprised a relatively stable conveyor of culture such that two people who have never met uh, but read the same thing might imagine themselves to be part of a single collectivity regardless of their social or, uh, or regional differences. Might we say then uh, that to the extent that Mondrowa and Sangay Gatso were able to identify their new government with the august tradition symbolized by the Buddhist canons, the Buddhist canons play an, an important role in the formation of, the, of Tibetan national sentiment. Even more tentatively, I would suggest that the, for the Dalai Lama and his associates, the Buddhist canons provided the very foundation upon which the political imagination flourished. The writings of these authors are evidence of a massive systematic attempt to create a state supported rhetorically by Buddhist doctrine. Seen in this light, perhaps we can view the Buddhist canons as sources, not only for the rich scholastic or contemplative philosophical traditions in Tibet, but for Tibetan traditions of political philosophy and social theory as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Curtis, for that very, uh, really outstanding paper. Um, our next speaker is Nancy Lin from the University of California at Berkeley. She will be speaking on two models of lay Buddhist kingship at the court of Miwang Polane. Thank you to Carl, Yorit, and the Rubin for inviting me here today. Thank you all for joining us. I'm just, I guess he's just gonna pull up my um, PowerPoint. No, it's not that one. Yeah, that one. Okay. Okay. So, with the strict law and firm orders of the excellent dual system of the Gundan Pojong, victorious in all directions, may the Dharma Raja, great treasury of profound mind and compassion, the second Songzen Gampo, endure. So wrote the Gaelic monastic scholar Puchong Gawang Jampa in a longevity prayer for Miwang Polone Sonom Topkye, the lay ruler of Tibet from 1728 to 1747, together with his sons. Smoothly connecting Polone's reign with the Gandan Pojong government of the Dalai Lamas, the poet's words of praise gloss over Polone's troubled rise to power in the wake of a succession crisis, foreign invasions, and civil war. While Polone reunified Tibet and established a period of stable rule, he also sent the seventh Dalai Lama Khelsang Gyatso into exile for seven years on the premise that his father had supported a violent coup. The Dalai Lama would not return to Lhasa until 1735 when Polone's administration was more firmly established. The two men continued to have a strained relationship until Polone's death in 1747. Puchok's verse thus delicately sidesteps these political divides and makes no mention of turbulent events. It suggests that Polonais was somehow upholding the system of religious governance established in the fifth Dalai Lama's time, uh, so expertly discussed by Curtis just now, uh, without going so far as to claim that Polonais directly supported the current Gundan Pojang of the seventh Dalai Lama. The fifth Dalai Lama's court had placed a reincarnate Lama at the head of government and had claimed authority over both dharmic and worldly spheres of activity. In the wake of this Chusi Zungjong model established by the Gundan Pojong, how could a lay person like Polone aspire to rule Tibet? On what basis could his kingship stand? Puchok's verse gives us a taste of the challenges faced by the court of Polone and its supporters. In his own time, the fifth Dalai Lama had reserved the right to grant the title of Dharma Raja, righteous king, Chuki Gyalpo, to Gushi Khan and his descendants, yet here Puchok applies it to the very person who exiled the seventh Dalai Lama. He further praises Polone as a second Songzen Gampo, likening him to the seminal figure who founded the Tibetan Empire and who reputedly introduced Buddhism to Tibet. Yet the Dalai Lamas themselves were widely considered to be later reincarnations of Songzen Gampo, a point that was dramatically underscored when the fifth Dalai Lama's court built the massive Potala Palace over the ruins of their imperial predecessor. In a landscape of religious rule so imposingly dominated by the shadow of the great fifth, where was there room for Polone and his followers to maneuver? As this first shows, one important strategy was to naturalize Polone and his court as fitting successors to the fifth Dalai Lama's Gundan Pojang. 
In the remainder of this paper, I argue that Polonais Court and his close associates also attempted their own distinctive version of Chusi Zhongzhou, which I translate here as the integration of Dharma with worldly existence. They did so by developing two models of lay kingship for Polonais, as a violent protector of the Dharma and as a virtuous donor operating in irenic mode. These twin persona referred to and drew inspiration from early Buddhist models of the Chakravartin ruler and the virtuous Dharma Raja, as well as from Buddhist tantric discourse, Indic, Puranic mythology, and historical exemplars across Inner Asia. Biographically corresponding to Polonais' military rise to power and his subsequent patronage of Buddhism, together the personae of violent protector and virtuous donor formed models of lay kingship that distinguished his dynasty from the Gundan Pojang. A portrait of Polonais during his reign styles him as a Chakravartin, a universal monarch who turns the wheel that signifies both his earthly dominion and his support of the Buddha Dharma. His chief attribute, a golden wheel, rests in his left hand. A mala held by his right hand underscores his Buddhist commitment. Below the seven emblematic jewels of the Chakravartin are displayed. The wheel, once again, held by the minister, the queen, the general, the elephant, the horse, and the jewel placed on the horse's back. By displaying the seven jewels, the donor portrait offers a classic expression of the Chakravartin as described in well-known Buddhist canonical sources, such as the Lalita Vistra Sutra. The display or offering of these emblems to rulers was widespread across the greater Tibetan world in the 17th and 18th centuries. Although no references have yet surfaced, it is likely that the seven emblems were also offered to Polonais or displayed on ceremonial occasions. Polonais' status as a powerful and majestic Buddhist king is bolstered by additional elements of this donor portrait. Outsized on his elevated throne, Polonais is accompanied by his two sons. All around swirls the court bustling with activity. An inscription below the throne um, identifies Polonais as an armed Chakravartin, or um, the Bala Chakravartin. Actually, Carl mentioned this in his tour yesterday. Uh, this subcategory of Chakravartins who use or threaten force in order to rule and whose dominion may be said to cover all of Jambudvipa, according to some sources, was paradigmatically applied to the Mauryan emperor Ashoka. It was later applied to other rulers, including Genghis Khan, the Yongle emperor, and the Chenlong emperor. By applying the label to Polonais, his court placed him among the illustrious ranks of Buddhist rulers who were celebrated for their vast territorial dominion as well as their dedication to promoting the Buddha Dharma. Descriptions of violence and rationales for committing it on a compassionate basis are well attested in Buddhist sutras and tantras. Even so, the work of Polonais' court is notable among Tibetan sources for its detailed descriptions of military activity. Its poetic glorification of violent action in wartime is likewise striking. When Purchikong and Jampa composed the catalog for the Nartang Dengyur, published late in 1742, he included a verse hagiography of its principal patron, Polonais. The hagiography is framed by an extended history of the Dharma up to his time, but it takes on a dark tone with the deaths of the fourth Pension and the fifth Dalai Lama. Then when the sun and moon, Chuki Gyaltsen, who was Amitabha in human form, and Ngaman Losan Gyatso, lotus in hand, great pundit with five knowledges, set on the western shore of the snowy land, demons from everywhere, central and outlying, inside and out, thorns wrapped in silk, closed the lotus grove of the virtuous world with the thick darkness of deeds and aspirations of those both low and high. The world was pervaded by a thick cloud of devastation, the din of hubris howled. As thunderbolts of sharp weapons consumed lives on both sides, the miseries of the three lower existences converged here, leaving hell's guardians with naught to do. At that time, from the womb of Droma in the house of Polan Nyangtu, came forth through the power of merit a Chakravartin who had countless prayers of upholding excellent dharma and preeminent valor that liberates, ev uh, liberates beings in evil times. In the face of that unbearable might, like a mass of fire devouring the threefold world, those weak of mind and dark of thought joined company with bodiless Kama. In this snowy land, many were the laymen and clergy of leading repute who, due to waging war that failed to consider the results of this life and the next, were smashed to dust together with their lineages. As if leading an army of kindling into the conflagration at time's end, no matter how much evil-minded people strove, his forces and dominion grew ever greater, overpowering all 13 myriarchies. 
Even the most supreme heaven-mandated emperors were captivated by his wisdom, compassion, and ability. Along with ranking as Palmyra chief and commandery prince, he was enthroned as leader of all Tibetan subjects. In the center of an ocean unfathomably deep and wide, his valor blazes jeweled majesty, his wise and compassionate nature. With dangling earrings of sun and moon, good deeds, dharmic and worldly, Mount Meru, Polone, is the ornament of the four continents, the sages' teachings. Uh, Polonais' rise to power is rationalized through the language of tantric Buddhist mythology and ritual. And I'm going to be jumping back um, in these verses I just read. Okay. Um, as J Jacob Dalton has shown, the Rudra myth and liberation rite distinguished between demonic violence and compassionate violence. Tibetan authors had characterized earlier Mongol invaders as barbarian demons paralleling Rudra's world con conquest. In Purchok's Tibet, racked by Kosha, Jungar, Qing, and civil conflicts, the demons come from everywhere, central and outlying, inside and out. These demons, Damsi, are a particular variety who have violated their vows in the past and who harm Buddhism. Polonais' preeminent valor that liberates beings in evil times adopts the euphemistic tantric usage of liberating beings to prevent them from further harming others as well as themselves. In the context of the Civil War, this refers to literally killing his enemies. His valor, Nintop, or in Sanskrit, Sattva, a term that carries both martial and spiritual connotations, is grounded by Polonais' wisdom and compassion as metaphorically elaborated in the last stanza. Jumping back to the end. Okay. Um, Polonais is that cosmic axis mundi, Mount Meru, his wisdom and compassion, its jeweled sides around which his valor, the ocean, is centered. In the degenerate era of the Kali Yuga that calls for the radical techniques of Tantra, Polonais' hagiography asserts that compassionate killing is sometimes the wisest course of action and that destruction itself can be a virtue. The drama of such destruction is intensified in these verses by imagery of end times that relies on both Buddhist and Puranic sources. Three key elements of this poetic account, account matched the standard account of the destruction of the world during the eon of dissolution as explained by Vasubandhu's Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna jump back one more time. Let's see, okay. Uh, so, so one people overcome by hatred massacre one another, um, two hell is emptied of its beings, and also the world is destroyed by fire, sort of, um, Okay, uh, yeah, this one. Um, the ap apocalyptic imagery shifts to take on positive valence, however, when Polonais is compared to the Puranic deity Shiva. Just as the body of Kama was incinerated by the fierce flame of Shiva's third eye, so the, the enemies of Polonais are destroyed by him. And just as Shiva destroys the world with a massive conflagration at the end of the cycle of yugas, so Polonais inexorably grows stronger against his enemies, emerging triumphant at the end of the war. The comparison is productive on a moral level as well. Kama, the god of love and desire, allegorically doubles for the desires the Buddhists must overcome in order to achieve spiritual liberation. And Shiva's destruction of the world is a purifying action at the end of the cosmic cycle, when the dharma has declined and humans fully succumb to greed, hatred, and other karmic impurities. In this grandly scaled narrative, Polonais brings a period of destruction and misery to a close and ushers in a new period of peace and stability, the perfect age once again. Like the emperor Ashoka as presented in the Ashoka Madana, Polonais is presented in this verse hagiography as a quote, Chakravartin who could rule an imperfect world, to borrow John Strong's phrase. But unlike the Ashoka Vedana, Portrug's hagiography of Polonais does not explicitly criticize his violent actions. Instead, it normalizes them under a tantric Buddhist rubric. As such, Polonais' military success more closely parallels that of Kalkan Raja Chakran of the Kala Chakra Tantra, at least according to this account. According to prophecy, this Bodhisattva emperor will appear at the end of the Kali Yuga to lead the army of Shambhala to victory against the barbarians who have come to dominate the world with their incorrect dharma. With the gods on his side, the Asura demons will also be defeated. Possessed of the great wheel, Raja Chakran will then reestablish Vajrayana Buddhism and reign over new golden age. 
In his glorification of Polonais' wartime deeds, then, Portrick presents him as an armed Chakravartin who operates in a tantric mode. His violent actions are justified through the tropes of liberating beings and restoring order to the world. Through a poetics of similitude, Polonais is placed in a recognized tradition of kings who righteously commit violence for the benefit of the world and its beings. Polonais' violent rise to power occupied a good deal of attention from those who sought to explain and shape his kingship. Other works comment in significant ways on the military aspects of Polonais' rule, including his biography by Dukhar Tsering Wangyal and the treasure, and work by the treasure revealer Leilung Shepi Dorje, although time doesn't permit me um, to discuss their work in detail just now. Uh, yet after the Civil War, um, the nearly two decades of Polonais' rule were marked by peace and stability. Visual and textual representations of Polonais accordingly shaped another persona for him, that of a virtuous donor king. Such imagery conspicuously alluded to classical Indic gods and to royal patrons who supported the Buddha Shakyamuni in his own lifetime, as well as to Tibet. Tibetan um, predecessors. In this talk, I will just focus on comparisons with the Buddha's royal patrons. Near the end of his life, Polonais and his two sons sponsored a set of 31 woodcuts depicting, wish -fil -fil depicting the wish-fulfilling vine adapted from the earlier design of the fifth Dalai Lama's court. The donor portrait of Polonais and his sons retains many elements of their earlier portrait. Their seating arrangement and relative proportions, the display of the Chakravartin seven jewels, and the bustling court activity. What is distinctive in the later woodcut design, however, is the way it highlights his similarity to ancient Indic exemplars who appear elsewhere in the pictorial designs of the wish-fulfilling vine. Um, at the bottom of the central tanka design of the same set, the following figures are seated in three-quarter poses to venerate the Buddha above his parents, uh, King Shudodana and Queen Maya, King Udrayana and uh, Anatta Pindada, King Bimbisara, and King Prasenajit. These are major patrons of the Buddha Shakyamuni in his own lifetime, and while they frequently appear in the context of narrative scenes of the Buddha's life, it is unusual for them to appear in an iconic portrait composition such as we find here. In addition to the comparable scale and analogous position within their um, respective compositions, oh, sorry. Too quick. Okay. Uh, Polonais' parallelism with Shakyamuni's earliest patrons is emphasized through their sharing of distinctive headgear, a jeweled crown topped by a white turban, along with similar earrings and pendant gao. The woodcut inscription identifies Polonais not as an armed Chakravartin, as in the earlier portrait, but as a Dharma Raja, a title that did not carry connotations of vast territorial dominion. The title of Dharma Raja was broadly applied to royal patrons of Buddhism, including Udrayana, Bimbisara, and Prasenajit. In the context of the Nartang wish-fulfilling vine set, labeling Polonai as a Dharma Raja reiterated his similarity with these virtuous donors. This parallelism uh, with ancient Indic kings was reinforced through public ritual performance as reported by Dokhar Tsering Wangyal's biography of Polonai, Legend of the Ruler of Men, Miwang Tokcha. The biography extols Polonai's sponsorship of two annual festivals, the Great Prayer Festival, during the first month of the Lunar New Year, along with the great offering on the death anniversary of the fifth Dalai Lama during the second month. Dokar West sets the scene by highlighting familiar equivalences of mythological space and time that recentered the Buddhist world in Lhasa and asserted Tibetan ownership over the continuity of the Buddhist tradition. The Hasa Gandola refers to the Jokong Temple. The choice of name assimilates the Jokong with the Mahabodhi Temple at Bodhgaya, which appears in Tibetan sources under the name Gandola, derived from the Sanskrit Gandalia, fragrant ab abode. By the 14th century, Hasa itself had come to be considered by Tibetans as the second Vajrasana. Moreover, popular Tibetan origin myth held that the Jo image was originally located in the Mahabodhi Temple. The Great Prayer Festival commemorates the Buddha Shakyamuni's defeat of the six non-Buddhist teachers in Shravasti through the performance of miracles for the first 15 days of the Lunar New Year. Within this narrative frame, the magnificent assembly of 12,000 monks in Lhasa echoes the gathering of many hundreds of thousands of Shakyamuni's followers to witness his miraculous performances long ago. In short, the originary places and deeds of the Buddha Shakyamuni are reenacted in Lhasa, especially during the month of the Great prayer festival, a point that is underscored by the narrative here. <clears throat> this mythologized, oops, um, this, 
mythologized scene is not set, however, for the Dalai Lama, who in the great fifth time had presided over the great prayer festival, but rather it's set for Polone, who at the end of this passage is likened to King Bimbisara as an exemplary donor to the Sangha. While the Buddha Shakyamuni reportedly accepted the patronage of several kings in his lifetime, Bimbisara is recognized as his first patron by the Mula Sarvastivad and Vinaya and other textual sources. According to the Sutra of the Wise and the Foolish, <clears throat> King Bimbisara was also the special donor on that climactic 15th day of Shakyamuni's performance of miracles. This occasioned another miracle in which, quote, all the vessels were spontaneously filled with all kinds of food endowed with a hundred flavors sating everyone in the numerous retinue, unquote. The food and drink given by Polone in Lhasa is hardly claimed to reach this wondrous standard, yet his biography still conveys the generosity of the donor. Like the original patron of Shakyamuni, Polone sets out to give the Sangha the best that he can muster, both in terms of quality and quantity. Oh boy. Through such actions, each year Polone richly reenacted the paradigmatic role of the virtuous lay king as patron of the Buddha and his Sangha, as modeled in mainstream Buddhist canonical sources. Okay. Uh, conclusion. Uh, Polonais court did much to glorify his kingship as violent protector and virtuous donor, and thereby one could surmise bolster the legitimacy of his role. But taken alone, this explanation underestimates the diversity of voices and interests involved. As I discuss in greater depth elsewhere, officials, lamas, and artists in Polonais' orbit took opportunities to shape his kingship in ways that may not have perfectly aligned with Polonais' own vision and values, or with each other's. With the violent Chakravartin of Prochok's hagiography, may, uh, while, while that championed the righteous cause of restoring the Buddha Dharma, there's still something awful about the horror of war. The author chose to metaphorically portray Polonaise deeds as those of non-Buddhist entities, Shiva and the cataclysmic fire. Other portrayals of Polonaise violent history that I didn't have time to discuss today are even more ambivalent. The work of Prochok, Dokarwa, and others in Polonaise orbit can be interpreted in both descriptive and prescriptive registers, that is, both as glorifying portrayals of Polonaise life and as statements on how Polonaise and rulers in general should behave to deserve the title of a righteous Dharma Raja or Chakravartin. As I aim to demonstrate in a longer study of Polonaise court, the multiplicity of voices, interests, and media at play resulted in constructions of lay kingship that were patterned on familiar precedents, yet resisted facile consistency or unqualified endorsement. Thank you. Our next speaker is Wen Xing Zhou of Hunter College here in New York. So one more great paper. First of all, thank you, Carl, for your fabulous exhibit and for gathering us here, and thank you to all of you for, for being here. In 1757, the, King, the, the Qing Qianlong Emperor dispatched his trusted advisor, the eminent Geluk reincarnate teacher, Zhang Jiaropei Dorje, as a Qing imperial representative to central Tibet to oversee the transition of power in the wake of the seventh Dalai Lama's death. Among the sumptuous gifts Zhang Jia's delegation, de delegation had brought to Tibet was a portrait tanka of the Qianlong Emperor. Oh. I don't know what happened. In which he appeared as an ordained monk, a Chakravartin, and you'll see the jeweled wheel here. So as a, the Bodhisattva Mandrushri, and, uh, and as the center of a vast spiritual pantheon in a Buddhist paradise. Tielo also ex provided explicit instructions with this image that the portrait tanka serve as a surrogate for making pilgrimages to the sacred images of Tibet, especially the Zhou Rinpoche, as well as for receiving veneration from both lay and monastic communities. This tanka seemed to have functioned accordingly, when the eighth Dalai Lama came of age, he initiated ritual 
uh, routine ritual offerings in front of it. The Tanka also came to substitute the Qing Emperor's presence in the ritual of the Golden Urn that, instituted in, that was instituted in the late 18th century to systematize Qing control, um, Tibetan system of selecting reincarnate lamas. How did an emperor's portrait then become a locus of Buddhist devotion, Geluk Buddhist devotion? The answer to this question is necessarily bound up within the longer history of Geluk Buddhists referring to the Qing emperors as kingly emanations of Manjushri. We've heard a little bit about that. And something that goes back to the time of the fifth Dalai Lama and the Qing founding emperors. Yet it was the persuasive language of Tianlong's Tanka portraits that articulated this notion of divine kingship with unprecedented specificity. The Tanka was not a one-off, but one among at least seven that were once displayed in the major monasteries in Beijing, Inner Mongolia, and Tibet. So here are six, oh, six extant versions. The majority of them were produced in the Qing Imperial Workshop, but some, such as this example seen here, were made in the Imperial Monastery of Yonghegong in Beijing. In my view, the success of such portraits that they became function, that came to function as devotional icons rests on a careful reformulation of multiple pictorial genres and traditions that were familiar to their makers and audiences and that were also understood to be efficacious. These included liturgically prescribed images, paintings of deity mandalas, transmissions, lineages, Buddhist paradises, as well as Chinese imperial portraiture and European Baroque realism. The results are images that display, on the one hand, a deep investment in the ritual power of objects in Tibetan Buddhism, and, the other, and on the other, a playful and appalling reworking of Tibetan Buddhist forms. Today, I will focus my, connection, uh, my discussion to one of the pictorial genres, uh, to the connection between the tankas to one of the pictorial genres called refuge field paintings, uh, which was first identified by, by Pat Berger, um, which called refuge field paintings. And Pat, refuge field paintings are used within Tibetan Buddhist meditative and liturgical contexts uh, of paying devotion to one's teachers. So by exploring the relationship between the Qianlong Tankas and the refuge field paintings, I show how the Qianlong Tankas harness the efficacy of a Tibetan liturgical object to advance a new Qing-centered orthodoxy. Max Oitman's recent study showed how various players of the qing Geluk nexus implemented the ritual of the golden urn by, quote, making a new procedure into an old routine. Similarly, the Qianlong Tankas played with the canonicity and orthodoxy of existing visual forms to substantiate their rule, and by doing so, that of the Geluk hegemony. So to start, uh, I think one can immediately observe a similarity between the Tianlong Tanka, which you see, an uh, example of which you see on the left, and the Refuge Peel painting on the right, uh, in which um, there are numerous, they're both uh, composed of numerous figures that are arranged uh, around this large central figure, uh, assembled in the, this loosely circular formation with additional groups above and below. Between the two compositions, many of the figures are similar. Uh, in fact, some depict the same uh, figures within the Geluk pantheon. So you can see Gargana, Atisha, Asanga, and so forth. Refuge field uh, is an abbreviation for field of merit of wisdom, field of merit and wisdom accumulated by numerous great, great teachers in whom one takes refuge. The idea then is that by taking refuge in this assembly of teachers, one can amass a great stock of virtue. Paintings of refuge field uh, pictorialize what a practitioner is instructed to visualize in a devotional practice uh, known as Lama Tripa, or teacher veneration. As with many other images in the Tibetan tradition, the painting can thus variously function as a reminder or as an expression of the practice of meditative visualization. So let's look at this uh, painting alone by itself. The composition of this painting, which is at the Rubin Museum, uh, is based on a 17th century uh, liturgy that by the name of Lama Tripa, composed by the fourth Pension Lama, 
a text that has been widely adopted as the standard textual prescription for the preliminary ritual devotion to one's guru or root teacher at the beginning of a tantric meditation practice. As a part of a longer liturgy of Lama Tripa, one imagines all of one's spiritual teachers, past masters and deities, in vivid detail, generates their idealized world, and invites all of them to come into this world. One then visualizes the teacher and deities dissolving into the guru, who eventually comes into one's heart through the crown of one's head. This visualization practice can also be understood as a gift exchange. By paying devotion to and receiving blessings from one's guru, the practitioner merges with the teacher, the guru, through ritual veneration. I quote a few lines from what, is in, uh, one, what the practitioner is instructed to visualize so we can get a flavor of what's, what is being pictorialized here. In the vast sky of indivisible bliss and emptiness, clouds of Samantabhadra's offerings gather. In their center, sorry. In their center is a wish-granting tree adorned with leaves, fruits, and flowers. At the top, a lion is a throne of blazing jewels on which is a, is a vast lotus, sun and moon. My guru, endowed with three kindnesses, sits there. In essence, he is all the Buddhas. In aspect, a saffron-clad monk with one face, two arms, and a radiant smile. His right hand is in a gesture of teaching, the doctoring, his left in a gesture of meditation, holds a begging bowl filled with ambrosia. He wears the three robes, the colors of a saffron, the colors of saffron, a yellow pandesis hat adorns his head. In his heart sits the pervasive master of Vajradhara with one face, two arms, and a blue-colored body. Holding Vajra and Bell, he embraces his consort Vajradhatu Ishvari. The text goes on to describe in detail this envisioned universe around one's guru. Significantly, in the Tanka, uh, these elements are individualized. Go back to this slide here. Teachers, deities, and protectors that are otherwise unspecified in the, in the liturgical text are now identified through iconographic features, and all of these figures have inscriptions underneath them. By doing so, the painting codifies a historical and religious genealogy that was otherwise left to be defined by the practitioner's own imaginative faculties, and it signals to the painting's institutional function as a lineage map. The painting's efficacy is thus twofold. It serves as a proof of an orthodox vision. Um, on the one hand, and on the other, it serves as a pictorial support for devotional practice. Well, complex in its pantheonic disarray, the image indexes the absolutely decisive role of the guru for one's practice within Tibetan Buddhism. The guru is the source of all teachings, the singular conduit between practitioner and practice. Contrary to the Zen Buddhist rhetoric of immediacy, this is the unapologetic claim of a mediated practice. All teachings and deities begin first and foremost with one's own guru in the center, through whom and through whom only is enlightenment possible. The guru in the central position here in this tanka is Tsongkhapa, the 14th century founder of the Gelug school of Tibetan Buddhism and the school of the Dalai Lamas. By the end of the 17th century, the Gelug school had become the largest religious political entity in Tibet and also the one religious institution that promised more orthodoxy and uniformity of ritual, curriculum than any other religious group, uh, Chinese, Chinese or Tibetan, across China and Inner Asia. And within the Geluk curriculum, Lama Tripa is the most universally practiced liturgy for every practitioner. The image was therefore the single most important representation of the universal authority of Geluk Buddhism at the time, a fact that Qianlong was no doubt aware of. Returning now to the Qianlong Tankas, through these. The, um, the image of Tsongkhapa is now replaced with a Qing emperor. So here um, you see on the, slide, on the screen is another Tanka uh, now in the Freer Gallery. To be sure, the efficacy of Tibetan Buddhist lexicon isn't the only one that's co-opted here. To enhance the immediacy of the emperor's presence in, the, in this cosmic order, Qianlong employed his favorite court painter, 
the Milanese Jesuit Giuseppe Castiglione, who, re who rendered the precise physiognomy of his face in a suppressed modeling technique drawn from the painter's training in Baroque realism. The rest of the composition was painted by Tibetan Buddhist monk painters of the Imperial Palace, the same painters who were, were also responsible for the production of other Buddhist images. If the tanka is assumed to function in the same way as a pictorial reminder uh, for Lama Tripa, it would imply that Qianlong is now the envisioned guru of this new refuge field. After all, it is through the alliance with the Geluk Lamas that the Qing emperor is ultimately brought Tibet into its fold. Qianlong's replacement of, or more precisely, conflation with the Geluk patriarch, Tsongkhapa, through his veristic appearance as an ordained monk in, the iconography of, uh, in this iconography of Tsongkhapa seems all too purposeful. At the same time, we also know quite a lot about Qianlong's own guru, Zhang Jia, who was the Qing state preceptor and chief translator, iconographer, architect, and diplomatic liaison of all things Buddhist and Inner Asia at the Qing court during much of his life. Qianlong, uh, Zhang Jia appeared consistently in a prominent position above um, Qianlong in all of the tankas. So here are two more examples. But to read the Qianlong tankas as evidence that the emperor was himself visualized as a guru, and that these tankas were in fact used for the ritual veneration of him, as a scholar has in fact suggested, would be to simplify the Qing pictorial and liturg liturgical intervention, uh, and reinvention in fact, and to undermine the liberty with which the Qianlong emperor and his court appropriated objects, images, identities, and practices. The earliest extant refuge field painting date to the same period as when Qianlong, the Qianlong's tankas were produced, that is, the mid to late 18th century. So it cannot be assumed that the Qianlong tankas designs were derived from the refuge field paintings in any straightforward manner. Rather, it is most likely that just as the envisioned world of refuge field was being expressed and codified into their pictorial and material form, the Qing seized the opportunity to insert the emperor's image into this cosmological representation as it was being formed. Moreover, with Qianlong's guru featured prominently in his own enclosed rondo directly above Qianlong, the tanka tilts the perspective, the pictorial perspective, from that of an envisioned universe to one that combines multiple subjectivities. There's Qianlong as guru, who can thus be envisioned as the source of all teachings, we can also read Qianlong himself as the subject who envisions his guru Zhang Jia atop his head. Further, the presumed viewer practitioner of this visualization witnesses the interdependent and divisible teacher discipleship that now mediates the spiritual universe. Refuge field paintings index the centrality of the guru in one's religious practice. Analogously, the Qianlong Tangkas index the emperor's extraordinary reliance on his Buddhist teacher, Zhang Jia, throughout the latter's life and service at the court. The bond between the, bond between the emperor and his Buddhist teacher is now at the center of the cosmo cosmopolitical order, where both of them are as crucial to the flourishing of the Geluk school as its founder, Tsongkhapa. This shifting of subjectivity is at the very heart of Lama Tripa practice. The longer liturgy, in fact, opens with a practitioner imagining and declaring oneself to be a teacher, deity, or Buddha. The visualization of the refuge field comes after one is transformed into Buddhahood. The spiritual universe of one's visualization eventually dissolves in oneself, into oneself by way of one's guru. In a similar way, the Qianlong Tankas compel us to toggle back and forth between Qianlong, his guru, and Manchu Shri. The ability to take the place and the perspective of another in a visual and visionary world, which is really the premise of ritual transformation in Lama Tripa, is thus underscored by the play of such subjectivities in the tankas. I hope it doesn't move forward as I start, okay. This very observation led me to the eighth tanka, shown on the left, which at first glance looks remarkably similar to several compositions of the Qianlong tanka, such as seen on the right. 
The central figure is, of course, none other than Zhang Jia on the left, who is recognizable by the characteristic lump uh, on his right cheek uh, that you see on many extant paintings and sculptures. Here's another example. While both figures appear in similar attires, gestures, thrones, um, there's no ambiguity concerning the central figures. Qianlong holds the jeweled wheel of the Chakravartin, while Zhang Jia holds a long live vase. Zhang Jia is recognizable through the iconographic attributes Bell and Vajra of his personal meditation on deity, Sakrasambara, whereas Qianlong on his right is framed by a hefty ornate throne back. Um, Zhang Jia on the left is surrounded by the same type of oro that appears in refuge field paintings. As we saw earlier, in the Qianlong Tankas, Zhang Jia appears in the position of the guru. However, in the Zhang Jia Tanka on the left, the corresponding position is occupied by a triad of Tsongkhapa and his two chief disciples. There's also a slight reshuffling in the lineage representations around the central figure. All the other subsidiary deities and protectors remain identical in the two tankas. The visual parallels and similarities between the two complicates an already fraught image-making practice. On the one hand, since Zhang Jia was Qianlong's beloved guru, the eighth tanka, unlike seven other ones portraying Qianlong, is, plausible, is a plausible pictorialization of what Qianlong and other disciples of Zhang Jia could visualize in their daily devotions. That is, it could have conceivably served as a pictorial aid for Lama Tripa, for their Lama Tripa. On the other hand, the affinity between Zhang Jia and Qianlong Tankas was also quite bold for an imperial workshop production. That Zhang Jia was represented by Qing court artists in identical attires and throne as those of the emperor and presiding, presiding over the same spiritual universe accords him with a status that, was, that has never otherwise been given to any subject of the emperor. And conversely, uh, we have also never seen any emperor being represented in the manner of his guru. In either scenario, the Qing Imperial Workshop's production of the Zhang Jia Tanka bridges the ontological gap between the refuge field paintings and the Qianlong Tankas. In the former, by creating an object that could operate within the devotional framework of Lama Tripa, and in the latter, by capitalizing on the fluid and interchangeable identities um, of teachers and disciples. After all, Lama Tripa is an exchange between the teacher and the disciple, with offerings given, bl given, given, blessings received, which is aimed at dissolving the teacher-student subject-object binary. The double portrayal of Zhang Jia and Tianlong as a focal point of devotional practice repositioned the visionary perspective refu of refuge field paintings by pictorializing not only the envisioned lineage of of and pantheon, but also the playful fluidity with which roles of deities and practitioners, teachers and disciples are shifting and merging. Returning now to the Potala Tanka. In conclusion, I have argued that the image's success rests on its creative experimentation with the visionary perspective of the refuge field paintings and with the shifting subjectivities of devotional practice that the image embodied an explicit ideological agenda meant the potentiality of ritual transformation and efficacy would have been the first and, foremost, a for, first and foremost concern for their designers. As unexpected as it must have been to see the Qing Emperor materialize through European Baroque-inspired realism at the center of a Tibetan Buddhist spiritual gene genealogy, it is important to remember that the visionary world of teachers generated by the practitioner's imaginative capacities would have been equally varied and subject to individual experience. Qianlong's Tanka acknowledges the fluid nature of visions and the fact that when pictorialized and materialized, their authority can be tailored and made real. It is this understanding of the flexibility of ritual, identity, and how images function that allow the Tankas to affect and affirm a new Qing-centered orthodoxy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those are, uh, it's been a real honor for me to be here. I'd like to also first to like, continue the tradition by thanking Carl for both the exhibit and also for the 
uh, this wonderful conference. I think you'll agree with me that these are all uh, th uh, four outstanding papers, and it's my uh, task, uh, for which I'm, I feel very honored, to discuss this um, uh, in terms of uh, to, le to offer a few comments that would allow us to structure uh, the discussion, which will follow. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. I want to put this in the, partly in the context of both the um, uh, both the uh, exhibit as well as also in the uh, within some other uh, the context of each other the different papers and in terms of the exhibit what I see the two key themes is first of all is creating a lineage a kind of canon that is a little bit different from maybe one that we usually find one being a kind of uh, um, a, a um, uh, the the for example, we have the Chinese lineage of the various Chinese dynasties, or we have the various historical periods in Tibet. This is an interesting lineage that goes from the Tibetan Empire to the Tanguts, to the Mongols, to the Ming, to the Manchus. It's a very, and I think it's a very important canon lineage that actually works um, quite, uh, quite nicely. It also, I also want to talk a little bit about the theme of sacral kingship, and which I believe is an important theme here that can br draw together and bring together some, uh, uh, some research that's been being done right now on that. Um, so let's take the first paper is Gendon Tembo's paper, and his paper discusses the Dzongka Kingdom, which is, can be seen as one of the fragments of the Tibetan Empire, or this is a, a, a question in dispute. Now, Gendon, Tempa, uh, Gendon Damba shows that the Dzongka Kingdom needs to be considered as an intermediary or rival with the Tanguts in being one of the mem in that lineage tradition from the Tibetan Empire through to the Tanguts, then to the Mongols. The, uh, the uh, Dzongka Kingdom uh, is, all, is very important. So, for example, he can test the previous attribution of the blue Achala to the Tangut artist, and Shed shows that it was offered by uh, Zhang Todru uh, to the Sakya master, Drakpa Jeltsin. Now, although Dzongka has been conquered by the Tanguts by this time, it did maintain its own, um, its own uh, religious lineage. Now, the Dzongka kingdom was also, as, we, as he showed, was in the midst of a lot of different various peoples. Uh, Karluk's Uyghur kingdom of Kocho, Khotan, as well as the Song and the Tanguts. So this is one of the reminders of the big theme of this conference and, and exhibition, that Buddhism, as a tool of imperial power, is very much made from export. Uh, that is, in fact, the archetypal way in which Tibetan-style Buddhism, or maybe all Buddhism, maybe all so-called world religions, becomes a world religion is through its identification with power, which is in turn placed in a, um, in a uh, uh, international framework. Now, I think I also have here... Uh, right. Is this showing up here? Uh, I had a, a, there was a PowerPoint, uh, uh, just two slides. Uh, that, did somebody want to put them up on the... Um, so um, it's not. Uh, so um, what I wanted to talk about was a little. Um, uh, Alan Strathern and Asfar Moen are working on um, uh, a similar on on uh, a typology of royal kingship. They're actually going to be doing a. a um, uh, oh wait, okay, right. Uh, they're going to be doing a conference in Oxford, and I was uh, it was I was honored to be uh, working uh, to give a, a workshop in o UT Austin, uh, where Professor Moen, uh, Moen works. He gives it interesting uh, varieties of sacral kingship. He maps it out according to two different variables. One is sort of imminent religion, that is to say, religion that is imminent within the world, and then one is transcendent religion. And one is active, one is passive, or passive active. And he gives this kind of interesting. Uh, four-way um, uh, four model of different types of kingship, one being sort of heroic kingship where the king is a divinized figure who just does what he wants and his, what he wants is, is divine. Or then in a, in a more passive way, we get to a sort of a cosmic king, a kind of king at the center of a mandala. Then when we have transcendent religion, a religion that is, is in some sense outside the world, then the king has to identify with that religion in one way, he might be a righteous or a doctrinal king who protects the um, uh, Dharma. He might be a zealous king. So these are different ways to look at these uh, material, I think, that might be um, quite helpful. And when we look at the actual um, uh, 
uh, organization. This is an example. The mandala is one way to look at this. Another way is through different um, uh, ways of organizing the world. So this is an example that actually comes from the 14th century in Mongolia. So of course, Mongolia is in the center. Uh, here is Mongolia in the center. Korea in the east uh, is white, red China, black Tibet, um, and green Tajiks. Um, so these are different schemas for organizing this type of, of, of uh, world. So when we look at the different uh, papers, what, I, what we find striking about them is that both um, Nancy Lin and also in um, uh, Wen Xing Zhou's paper is the recognition that the, the Chakravartin king is uh, the, 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 the royal, the, the pattern of royal kingship involves contradiction. It involves embracing different things that are seemingly not, um, uh, uh, don't mix. So we have we, uh, Polane, is, he is a, a, a killer who kills as a sort of, um, as a, oh, excuse me. Um, yeah, this, um, well, he's a sort of a killer who kills as a kind of um, um, a, uh, in the service of the Dharma, and yet he's also a presenter, or someone who presents offerings with pure hands. We have Chakra, um, Chen Long is a kind of a mediator. He's kind of, kind of a, law, uh, a, a, a householder figure, but also kind of a monastic figure. And we actually show, and then um, Curtis Schaefer's paper shows clearly how the fifth Dalai Lama is working within very much uh, this uh, transcendent religion. He is, a, um, he is a figure who aligns himself with the scriptural realities. But as Curtis shows, actually these alignments of the fifth Dalai Lama, whether in life or death, with the scriptural norms, they're worth paying attention to precisely because the norms are in fact thoroughly transformed. He's showing that he's uh, creating new scriptural form, uh, norms through the reinterpretation of scripture. As he says, it's the canon that authorize, authorizes contemporary innovation. So this righteous and zealous kingship of the fifth Dalai Lama is thus not a sort of uh, a stereotypical one, but it's something equally as creative as these cosmic and heroic kingships. So to conclude these thoughts, royal authority in, in all its forms involves somehow overcoming the seemingly contradictory uh, making radical innovations look like fulfilling the scriptures, being a monk and being a householder simultaneously, being a holy warrior who also stretches out offerings with pure hands to the Buddha in a very peaceful fashion. But it's evidently not just any contradiction will do. What these papers illustrate is that a sacred king has to embrace contradictions, be unpredictable, but only a way that's somehow consistent and is also exactly what his constituents expected all along. Thank you. Okay, while we get some light on the stage, would anyone like to ask the first question? Hi, my name is Tamara Ellis. I'm a research fellow at the LSE South Asia Center. Um, I was just wondering, uh, in terms of the a couple of the papers in sort of um, speaking of the Dharma and champions of the Dharma, but at the same time committing killing or at the same time uh, bringing forth things uh, that are against the teachings of the Dharma. How, how is this accepted and if, are there any writings on in terms of how, whether there were any difficulties in having these uh, apparently um, disassociated things actually being accepted as, as part of the Dharma? Yeah, thanks, great question. Um, I think the fact that they felt the need to argue based on Buddhist scripture, uh, that these um, acts in wartime were 
um, in some sense okay, in, in some sense that there's, that there's a deepness there, but it means that they, they were conflicted about them. And the other thing I'll say is that there's a lot of literature that doesn't come from the center, um, that comes from the Himalayas or it comes from uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern Tibetan cultural regions that are deeply critical of um, activities in central Tibet um, about violence, but also about just the very act of state construction. Um, I can speak to that as well. So um, I think one of the things that I'm, I was trying to show in my paper is that uh, there are resources in the Buddhist tradition for rationalizing and um, supporting the use of violence and that Pusha Namajampa to some extent drew upon that in his writing about Miwang Polony's rise to power, but at the same time I see this kind of, this some ambivalence that he didn't sort of go all the way and, and by uh, metaphorically pitching Polony as a non boost deity, as Shiva, for this destructive act that there is, uh, we, we see some um, ambivalence there. And in some of my other work and other writings about Polony's reign, either during his lifetime or afterwards, they're more critical uh, of, uh, of uh, what he did and uh, whether this can be considered uh, a virtuous uh, Buddhist activity or uh, whether, yeah, the, this is the highest sort of Buddhist activity. There is a lot of, I think, com conversation and controversy about that and that's what makes this so interesting to look at in detail, right? Thanks. Um, I have a question for Wen Xin Zhou. Um, uh, first of all, I really just appreciated all of these presentations. And uh, in, in thinking about this uh, refuge field and Qianlong Emperor inserting himself into this refuge field, uh, the presentation that you've given us has really emphasized uh, how Tibetan Buddhists can visualize this as a, as a special connection with the emperor, right? That this is a, a unique place for the emperor to find himself in and also for uh, Chang Jirope Dorje to uh, be assuming within the empire. Mm -hmm. um, but we know also that there's other paintings, right? That Qianlong, there's, you know, these other paintings that he has of himself as a Confucian scholar, as a Han, uh, and you know the idea of other scholars has been that you know he's sort of role playing his uh, specialness to each individual community. So I was just wondering what you make of that tension. Uh, is this a special painting and a special tradition, or is that sort of the point that we're meant to feel that way? Uh, thank you, Stacy, for that question. Um, I think they do function in similar ways. Uh, previously, scholars have mentioned words like masquerade, right? Um, uh, Wuhan has written about. I think maybe what I'm trying to show in this paper is that it's uh, in this very deeply invested way. Um, and that may be, that would be probably the same for all of the, these other cases where Qianlong appears as a, as a Confucian um, scholar, antiquarian, um, fashions himself um, in these other spheres as a kind of uh, Manchu horseman. I think they, they, in all of these cases, there is a very high level of investment. I think what perhaps um, we haven't paid as much attention to is how in this Tibetan devotional context, it, it could have worked so well, and that's what um, uh, uh, sort of led me down this path. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thanks again to all the presenters. Uh, my question is a follow-up directly on the one just posed. Mm -hmm. um, you've made a pretty convincing case that uh, the, uh, the, certainly uh, looking at the iconography that Chenlong is being shown as a guru, that his, he's being portrayed as a teacher and to be venerated as a teacher. Um, so my question, I suppose, is whether we need to change the titles that we give to these paintings. 
You continue to use Qianlong as Mandragosa Emperor, uh, and that's what it says in most of the catalogs. Right. Right. But if uh, Professor Zhou were to rewrite these catalogs, would she continue to use these titles? Or do you think that we should... I mean, is he being portrayed as the Manjugosa Emperor, really, is my question for you. Or is there, are there a couple of different registers, or right. maybe multiple ones, that, that are being used here? Um, and, and what does that do to how we have understood these paintings, all the way back, going back to certainly David Farquhar? Uh, so, so thank you for yeah, the question. Sure. I think the, the title is the re direct result of David Falkar's article, which uh, gathering from other sources, mainly Tibetan sources of the way they refer to the Manjushri Emperor as Mandrugosha Emperor. Uh, and so in a way, what Falkar's article saw was like, well, this is a kind of another supporting evidence for this our larger argument of seeing this way of referring to uh, the Qing emperors as, as, as Manjushri. Gosha emperors. That's certainly the case in the sense that the Tankas, in fact, do depict Qianlong as Mandru Gosha. But as you rightly pointed out, there are so many different layers. In fact, my, what I'm presenting here today is only one kind of images that I'm trying to argue is what uh, the Qing court is trying to co-opt and appropriate and make new. Uh, there are numerous other ones and there could be many <laughs> more papers. I'm, I'm, I have my work cut out for me. Um, in terms of the layers of, of, of assertions, uh, I think for the purpose of this paper, we would retitle the, the paintings as Qianlong as an ordained, uh, Qianlong as, uh, or uh, Qianlong as guru, we could do that. But for the purpose of titling these works in general, titles are really difficult, for the, especially for these paintings, for the precise reasons that there's also the Chakravartin element. There's also this kind of really uh, affinity to, to Tsongkhapa. There are also these affinity to other types of images, such as uh, Amitabha's Paradise. And these, uh, this other image that I'm very interested in is it's called Tongwa Dongden, or seeing, upon seeing, one can get immediately be expelled of all past scenes from past eons of life, that these images also take after. And so those have the Buddha in the middle. And so, so it's, it's, as you say, it's really layered. And so I think for lack of a better title, they have been go the English title has been that. The Qianlong's, the archival document does have a certain uh, names to them, and they're something like uh, Qianlong, uh, the, 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 I think, they, usually in Chinese it's called Fo Zhuang Tangka. Uh, it doesn't appear that often, but this term has appeared. So someone who's in the Buddhist guise could be robes or as Buddha. So I think it, it is true that it's very partial to think about, uh, it's very sort of incomplete to think of these Qianlong as Mandragosha, but that is an important part that I didn't have time to really emphasize, and that really, um, yeah. a question of Gendendamba. Um, I found your paper was very interesting and um, I'd like to, a lot of it relied on dating, moving dates forward uh, from say 5th, 6th century to the 11th century. Um, and I'd like to know, is, does that leave other, other, other Buddhist artworks in that area which actually would be dated to the 5th, 6th century or is in a sense, is the Dzongka kingdom the beginning of the tradition of Buddhist art within that particular area? So one of the evidences that I presented is the is the 
uh, the inscription on the on the, on the Kev Monastery in 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 Tentic, south south uh, south to Tentic, Tentic Monastery, and it the the orthographic features of that money uh, or money pemehon actually it's it doesn't uh, something like that doesn't appear in in, in document that uh, from from the sixth. So, uh, sixth or uh, fifth or sixth century, it mainly uh, similar sort of um, uh, inscriptions appear. Like the in the, in the Om Mani Padme Hum, you have a, a unique sort of a ma symbol, which is not a, a full circle but a half circle. And then Achong, the small a, has a a small kind of a hat like uh, tick to it. And, and so these are uh, like very much. Uh, Characteristic of the 11th century artistic work uh, in in the Tsongkhapa Kingdom. That's one. Mm. And then, yeah, in the history of uh, religious history of Dewa Chimjong, uh, I don't know how to translate the text, but uh, a religious, uh, a text of religious history um, talks about how um, there were artistic production of Buddhist art, artistic production in the region in, in, in Songkha Kingdom at the time.